In today's video, I'm going to talk about a few stats from the 2023 season that I find pretty interesting, and the first one comes from Jaron Jackson. Right now, Jaron Jackson Jr. is the odds on favorite to win Defensive Player of the Year. One of the crazier stats from Jaron this year is his block discrepancy in home and road games. As I'm making this video, he averages 4.1 blocks at home and 2.2 blocks in road games. That's a huge difference in the amount of blocks you're getting just from playing in a different arena. If you were on NBA Twitter or NBA Reddit on Saturday, you saw the controversy surrounding Jaron's stat discrepancy at home and on the road. The claim was that, in certain situations, the Memphis Grizzlies scorekeeper was boosting the block and steal numbers of Jaron Jackson. The conspiracy is, these boosted block and steal numbers will help Jaron win Defensive Player of the Year. The problem is, the finalized stats of every game are done by the NBA, not by some random employee on the Grizzlies. So even if this guy is boosting his stats here and there, the NBA is going to correct most of it. Not to mention, people went through all of his blocks and checked that less than a handful of them were questionable. That situation about his home and away stats is pretty funny. You can't rig the fact that the Grizzlies went from a below average defense in the beginning of the year without Jaron to one of the best with him when he came back from injury. Why would the NBA rig a Defensive Player of the Year award or grease the numbers for a Memphis Grizzlies player? There isn't a Memphis Grizzlies agenda being pushed anywhere besides people thinking that Jaron is a Defensive Player of the Year. He's been amazing this year and the guy everybody was saying he was going to be when he got drafted. When you think of the modern defensive big man that can blow up actions on the perimeter, defend the rim with his length. One of my favorite things about Jaron this year is occasionally you'll see him let guys go past him so he can get a chase down block. It is weird he averages way more blocks at home than on the road. Four blocks a game is crazy. I would understand if a player averages more assists or points in home games. You pass the ball a lot in a game. You get several opportunities to score the ball over 48 minutes. Getting a block is not like dishing it out to an open shooter or scoring in transition. It requires a lot of timing, athleticism, and sometimes you might not even get the opportunity to go for a clean block depending on what's happening during the game. Maybe the reason he's less active on defense on the road is because he gets a bad night of sleep at the hotels or something. The next stat of the video comes from another player on the Grizzlies, and that is Steven Adams. He has a higher individual offensive rebound rate than the Brooklyn Nets and the Dallas Mavericks. A better offensive rebound rate than two whole teams. He really is the best rebounder in the game to me. Great at boxing out, great at grabbing rebounds in traffic and putting it back up. Being almost 7 feet tall and abnormally strong for sure helps, but he's good at being in timely spots where the ball bounces after a miss. Not all teams crash the glass. Some teams have philosophies where everyone gets back on defense, so that could have something to do with it. But one guy having a better offensive rebounding percentage than two entire teams is wild to me. He's out because of an injury for a while, but the next time he plays, just watch him after a miss. Sometimes he just barrels right past two people and goes up with a shot. This is probably one of the more interesting stats that shows the type of parity we have in the league this year, and we haven't seen this in a while. The Boston Celtics team net rating is 5.5, which would be the lowest net rating for a team with the best record in the NBA since 1988. I kept going back to old NBA seasons on Basketball Reference to find something lower, and the lowest I found was the 1988 Lakers, who came in at a 5.8 net rating. Every year after, you had teams with at least a 7 or an 8, or even in the 10s. You see a number that low and say, wait, I remember the Warriors from the 2016 season having something higher, the Big 3 Heat, the 2019 Bucks having a better net rating than this. A team with a 5.5 net rating is a good team, but it would just be a team in the top 10. Compared to last year, a 5.5 net rating would be 6th in the league. So what does this mean? There's no overwhelming favorite to make the finals this year. On paper, the Celtics are the best team and I would favor them if the playoffs started today to make the finals, but they get in so many dogfights with teams they should be beating by double digits. Maybe it might not matter that the Celtics are in these close games. If Chris Middleton is not going to be a top 30 player for the Milwaukee Bucks, they are much easier to game plan against defensively in the playoffs. They don't have another relief valve on the perimeter besides Drew Holiday, and he takes a lot of tough shots in those situations. The Nets have KD and Kyrie if healthy, so you always have to worry about them. This is the best the Sixers have ever looked in the regular season in the Embiid era to me. The team has a solid rotation, but the Celtics have handled Embiid in the playoffs over multiple series, so we'll see if that continues if they match up in the playoffs. The Cavs are good, but still one year away from really contending to me. You can make a case for around eight teams to make the finals this year, it's never been like that. It's only been around three or maybe five teams, but never almost 10. You usually have around one or two teams that just run through the regular season with a crazy net rating, but not this year. Ben Simmons has had an interesting year with the Brooklyn Nets and not in a good way. 
on the year he has 127 personal fouls but has only made 124 shots is there a correlation between made shots and fouls not really it's just funny that someone who plays on the perimeter and plays almost 30 minutes a game commits more fouls than he makes shots and it's even crazier because you can understand having a lot of fouls as an elite perimeter defender sometimes. You get beat occasionally, so you go for a foul, or you play more aggressive to give the offensive player something else to think about. But the thing is, he hasn't been an elite defender this year. He's just been okay, and it's been Nick Claxton who has saved the Nets defense from disaster. That one year in Philly, Simmons was a top three defensive player of the year candidate, and this year he's not even getting talked about as someone who can make second team all defense. You see declines on offense some years from other players, but a defensive decline like this is crazy when you factor in that he doesn't even look at the basket when he's 8 feet away from it. Kyrie and KD are expected to lead this team. He has one or two jobs. No one expects him to get back to that rookie year where he was outplaying the Miami Heat starting lineup and winning games without Embiid. That's another crazy part. This guy was winning playoff games against a Heat team that was top 10 in defense that year in 2018. What happened? The Nets are still in the finals conversation, but the Simmons thing is one of the things that's holding me back from fully trusting this team. The most clutch player this season, according to NBA.com, has been DeMar DeRozan, who has scored 113 points during the clutch portions of the game this season as I'm making this video. Clutch time, according to NBA.com, is the last five minutes of a game and the teams are within five points. But DeMar isn't who this part of the video is for, it's for the guy in second place in clutch points, and that is De'Aaron Fox of the Sacramento Kings. At the time of this recording, Fox has a total of 108 points in the clutch this year. You compare that to last season, Fox had 80 points in the clutch over 30 games and shot 42% during those moments of the game. So not only is he scoring more in the clutch in less amount of games, he's shooting at a better clip in those moments as well. De'Aaron Fox up until this year was not someone I would think of as a guy who orchestrates an offense down the stretch of a close game and beats good teams in the West. In the last 10 to 15 years, when did you think of the Kings as a team that you could trust down the stretch of a game and outsmart the other team? It was the complete opposite. Until the last four to five weeks of the 2022 season, I was pretty low on Fox and not sure what kind of future he had as someone who's being paid $30 million to lead their team. We've seen players have strong finishes to a year, but then never follow it up. He's building off of that last season. This is his best year easily. The Kings right now are a good combination of Fox improving and the team getting better around him. He's taking care of the basketball. He's getting to the mid range more. He's taking advantage of the spacing the Kings have on the court. Congrats to Kings fans on actually getting to watch a non-trash team. I hope they finish as a top four seed so they can get home court. That first national televised home playoff game in over a decade will be wild. If you watch this channel, this part probably isn't news to you, but I still wanted to include it and talk about Jeremy Sohan in general. Since December 19th, Spurs rookie Jeremy Sohan has switched his free throw form. He said, I'm done with the way I've done it my whole life and I'm shooting them with one hand and it's actually working. In the beginning of the season, Sohan was one of the worst free throw shooters in the league, shooting below 50% from the free throw line. A perimeter player shooting below 50% from the free throw line is crazy. You have a problem and something needs to be fixed. Since he started shooting with one hand since December 19th, he's up to 77%, a huge jump from the 46% he was shooting earlier in the year. Talking about Sohan as a player in general, if he's taking coaching like this and can improve this quickly, what kind of player are we looking at in year three? He's six foot eight, has athleticism, he can handle a little bit. I'm wondering where he can get to as a player once he's more comfortable in the system and surrounded with a good distributing point guard. That 30 point game against the Suns in overtime showed why he was a lottery pick. And that's it for me. Appreciate it if you made it to the end of this one. Like the video as it helps the channel and I'll see you in my next one.